Greetings. Thank you for joining us. Today is November 23rd, 2021. I'm Steve Shields, president of the Royal Asiatic Society, Korea. On behalf of the officers in council, I welcome you to our lecture. By way of reminder, lecture content does not necessarily reflect the opinions or positions of Royal Asiatic Society, Korea. The Royal Asiatic Society traces its beginnings to India in the late 1700s and was formally chartered in London in 1824 by King George IV. The Royal Asiatic Society of Great Britain and Ireland granted a charter to the Korea branch in 1900, which was the fourth year of the Kwangmu Emperor of Korea. RAS Korea expresses sincere thanks to our generous sponsor, Asia Development Foundation, for their continuing support. We especially thank our members who have paid their annual dues. Your dues provide essential primary funding for RAS Korea. Without your membership, we would not be able to host the lecture series. We would love to have you join us if you're not already a member. It only takes a few minutes to sign up. Membership gives you the opportunity to support the world's first and oldest Korean studies organization. For 121 years, we have strived to explore and promote all facets of Korea's rich heritage. Members receive our annual journal. Members are also recognized reciprocally by most of Asia's RAS affiliated societies, as well as the London-based original RAS. See our website at raskb.com for details. And in a few moments, I'll post a link for you in the chat box. If you are not a member tonight and are able to do so, we request a one-time admission fee. I've set that information on the shared screen, which I hope you can see. And I'll also post a link in the chat box uh, in a few minutes. We are joined tonight by Dr. Katie Oh, who will be sharing about her new book, North Korea in a Nutshell. And Katie, you're joining us from where? Northern Virginia, Fairfax Northern, County. Fairfax County, Virginia. That Fairfax County is an important county in Virginia. We hear lots about- Blue that. County, we say. It's a blue <laughs> county. Mm -hmm. uh, so we really appreciate Katie being with us at Oh Dark Early. Uh, in Virginia on the east coast of the U.S. Um, <clears throat> Dr. O oh is now an independent scholar. She was formerly a senior Asia specialist at the Institute for Defense Analysis. She was a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and a member of the political science department of the RAND Corporation. She has taught at University of California, San Diego, George Washington University, University of Maryland, University College in Asia. She's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, the Board of Directors of the United States Committee of the Council for Security Cooperation in Asia Pacific, and the Board of Directors of the Korea Economic Institute of America, and is the co-founder and former co-director of the Korea Club in Washington, DC. How you ever have time to write a book, <laughs> you ask the busiest people to do things, right? <laughs> After the lecture, as, as always, we'll have time for questions. So without further ado, welcome, Katie. We're excited to have you with us. Thank you for being here. OK, before beginning my presentation, I would like to ask how many minutes do I have well, for my present presentation? You can take about an hour. Wow. If you'd like. But, uh, but I think with this very enlightened and elite audience, I think I will try to finish about in 40, 45 minutes. That's so fine So we can too. have a lot of uh, time for the Q&A. Plenty of time. Yeah. Yep. OK, very anyway, good. Anyway, it you. was a very elegant introduction and uh, again reminded me of the importance of the Royal Asiatic Society working in Asia. It's a very important institution. And uh, I could not say no to this invitation simply because I really respect the RSA. At the same time, the one of my dear friends, Andrew Salmon, was the one who linked the, you with me. And so I'm very glad to share my views with you. 
since the time given to me is very generous because I'm used to the time usually five to 10 minutes briefing to the high market in Washington DC. So 45 minutes, 50 minutes is a really generous time. I would like to maybe begin with, with uh, my slight introduction of my background, why I became North Korea specialist out of so many interesting countries in subject matter. Uh, basically, I was born in South Korea, a slightly less than a year before the Korean War. Exactly my birthday is Independence Day of 1949. And uh, I received a college degree and also graduate the master's degree in top universities in Korea. And when I finished my master's degree in Seoul National University Graduate School, I was supposed to be a professor of a Korean college in Seoul area, but I was the youngest, unmarried and female. Plus I came from different uh, school before the Seoul National University, which is a Sogam University Jesuit institution. With these four worst conditions, uh, the professors refused to write a letter of recommendation when I applied for the universities. Without the letter, you cannot even apply. So basically I ended up teaching at University of Maryland overseas campus for four years. It was an interesting job and I wanted to stay there, but my students discovered maybe I have a better capacity in a bigger world, uh, getting the different degree. And all of them encouraged me, why are you becoming a small fish in a small pond? Please go to the US. So at my age of 30, can you imagine? All my friends married and their daughters and children become going to kindergarten and grammar school. I was unmarried and I decided to leave for UC Berkeley. Actually, I was admitted by all major Ivy Leagues, but the Ivy League didn't appeal to me, but I like the name Berkeley and also the background. So I chose Berkeley and I studied Asian politics, international relations. And I wanted to major in Chinese studies, but uh, I, I have a dear professor who is well known, Dr. Robert Scalapino, who is now deceased. He is the pioneer of North Korean studies in the United States. So he had a huge grant and uh, he needed a research assistant and he found me as a bilingual speaker. So he asked me to be his research assistant. My main job is basically reading Give me some books, uh, daily newspapers and channels and everything, and then interpret the important points and the write a report for him. Let me tell you, <laughs> I love to read. For the first time in my life, I found the reading can be a torture. <laughs> I couldn't sustain, but the research fund was good. Plus my professor needed my help. So I keep, kept working. After I got my degree, I was supposed to go to a postdoc to East Coast, but uh, my professor asked me to stay one year or two years at Berkeley and to establish the Center for Korean Studies to enhance its program. So I accepted it. And uh, when the Center for Korean Studies really now firmly footed on the solid foundation, uh, I was about to take off again. And then the Rand Corporation based in Santa Monica, the world's great uh, security and international affairs and strategic centers, their leaders visited Berkeley for international conference and they saw me and they asked me to come to Santa Monica. Uh, it was a free invitation, no obligation. I went down there and then suddenly they offered me a job saying that, we don't have any Japan Korea expert. My dissertation was on Japan Korea relationship. So I said, I will think about it, but the compensation benefit and the environment was very enticing. So I accepted and I worked there. My first task at Rand Corporation was basically the president and directors asked me to write about something important report on North Korea. Why? Because I joined in 1987 and Kim Il-sung is getting weak. Kim Jong-il, his son is appearing and uh, not many things are reported then. So I said, fine, 
I wrote the succession politics from father to son, and that about 80 page report become a sensational report within the US government and global community. I was suddenly a region star in North Korean studies. So I must put it this way. I was an accidental tourist kind of situation. I didn't mean to, but to be a North Korean specialist, but once you started, you just dig and dig. So, but becoming a specialist required some kind of talent or some kind of disciplinary training. And I must say I was benefited by three points. First of all, my parents were from North Korea. During the colonial period, my father studied in China and then they decided to settle in the South because they saw the dirty politics, divisional, factional strife between the Koreans. And uh, my father was a professor and our house was a gathering place of all the professionals. And they are all from the North Korea. They were professionals in the North, but they settled in the South. And we entertained them over the parties. I sat next to my father and observed their dialogue and discussions. And I even learned how to speak North Korean dialect. Can you imagine? I never thought that that special uh, the, the tool became very useful when I begin to interview North Korean defectors. North Korean defectors using different dialect. I should say differences between New Yorker and Oki. So sometimes the vocabulary is different. So when I hired the research assistant to interview with me, actually she became more burdened because she could not understand a single word. I understood everything. And that was the first reason why I was benefited by my background. Second thing is that, you know, I grew up in Korea. I was born in South Korea, lived 30 years. When I was growing up, Korea was dirty, nasty developmental state. The power politics in the hands of a very limited number of either civilian or military turned into civilian leaders. They were corrupt, they were rotten, and they were really nasty politics. So observing them growing up in that society, I begin to understand the nature of Korean political elite behavioral science. North Koreans are not very different from South Koreans. They are same genes. So basically in understanding North Korean policy elite, I begin to apply what I know about South Korean policy elite, factionalism, inner court, bribery, corruption, networking, all these things. Finally, um, I got a lot of questions from young students how do I become a North Korean specialist? Is there any royal road or magical you know, trick? I said, no. Uh, I use an analogy. If you stay in the cave, dark cave, at first you don't see a single thing, but you develop sense, your eyes opening up and you can understand what's going on inside the cave. Long patience, endurance, quiet observation, constant intellectual inquiry make you be a specialist. And occasionally you have a very rare insights occurring to you. So that's my background. So I am a well-claimed North Korean policy analyst in the United States. So I began to decide to write uh, some of my findings and understandings for educating Americans basically, because Americans were just totally ignorant of what North Korea is about. So first book was the very famous book called North Korea Through the Looking Glass, published 2000 by Brookings. That book covers everything from history to the policy suggestions. At the last chapter of the policy suggestion, basically uh, we, we means I co-authored with, uh, with my research partner who is Dr. Ralph Hassid and he happened to be my dear husband. <laughs> and Steve asked me, how did you write all this stuff when you are working very hard? And I say, I have a research partner and we share the time together and we use the nights and weekends and summertime. And basically our conclusion is that the best way to change transform North Korea is educating North Koreans revealing them to the outside truth and information. 
and let them decide their fate, as South Koreans did. And I thought that was a great book. And actually that book was read by all president and the secretaries of defense and the state. And basically they loved it, but they never learned anything properly. So you remember Arab springtime when the, even the sub-Saharan states and Arabia, Arab the states are changing and the, the demonstrating against the regime. So many people asked me, Katie, why North Koreans are so quiet? They're dying with hunger and pain and torture and gulag. Why there is no revolution? So I said, you don't understand. So I decided to focus on North Korean people this time. The second book was the hidden people of North Korea. It means they are basically behind the hidden large size Kim body <laughs> or curtain, iron curtain. And uh, uh, this book was uh, possible because of uh, I interviewed a lot of uh, very smart and uh, strategic thinking defectors. And that was the basically providing the basic knowledge about uh, all the people's daily life. What do they think? How do they live? What's their daily life from morning to night? What do they, why don't they stand up against the cadre and the government? And uh, I thought that book was good too but they never learned anything at all. So when the Kim Jong-il died and Kim Jong-un become the new leader, the, our publisher said, you have to change it. So we wrote the revision third book. Finally, the North Korea in a nutshell uh, was published uh, uh, Ju July, uh, in June. And uh, this book is basically our 30 year plus research aggregated knowledge Bottom line is basically, uh, we would like to write a book simply written, clearly presented. So then uh, any lay audience, if you have a middle school, a high school, even graduate the, the degree, you can understand. So to do that, we have to select the critical topics from history to the foreign policy, to military, to economy, to transportation, to culture, to government, to social control and the prison life and the cultural life and everything. So uh, selected about the 50 some small topics and about the nine chapters. And the, finally the concluding chapter, we repeated the same thing. The transformation in improvement of North Korean society only comes from North Koreans, not by outsiders not imposed by war, not threatening them with economic sanctions. So basically we again repeated the same message that we started in our first book. Uh, one thing that I would like to emphasize at this point is that there is an implicit uh, message throughout the book. What is that implicit message? Basically message to the US government and all foreign governments who have been preoccupied with the weapons of mass destruction. Everything about North Korea's nuke and missiles, nuke and missiles. Last 30 years, many US presidents engaged in getting rid of the nukes and denuclearize North Korea. And early on in the early 1990s, even around the time the agreement was made between North and the US. I told the US policymakers, look, Kim regime will never give up nukes. So you have to find another way to get rid of nukes. That's the transformation of North Korean society and politics. Regime change in a sense, although a lot of military use the regime change in sort of a dirty environment such as Iraq and Afghanistan, which failed. But basically my argument to the, all the top leaders is that there is a way to do it, but I guess they didn't listen. So that's my implicit message. So if I go through the North Korean, uh, the, this book's uh, basic synopsis is that uh, without uh, introducing the, each chapter about the leadership government and all these things, 
I hope by now you are either planning or you already bought the book and read it. It's a very good book. If you have this book, you don't need any other dictionary because it has a great index at the back, which was done by my husband. And you can find any topic that you would like to know further with the detail. The book's synopsis is very simple. Although North Korea is a closed society, life goes on there as just like anywhere in the world. They have their own desire. They have their own pleasure. They have their own wish, dream. And so in a sense, kind of sad that other than about the 1 million Polish elite and the chosen cadres for the regime, the other 24 millions are basically hostages of the regime and servants to the leader. But even in that confinement and in such a dire uh, environment, they do their best to live a best life. So in a sense, it's the, it's the closed world filled with the people who had the same dream, same desire. And I think that's a very sad thing. And that's the reason why uh, we try to emphasize, we have to give them the tools for them to change the society. North Korea is, in a sense, is a very wounded and traumatized society. I, I don't know how much you know about the Korean history, but when most Westerners, Western political scientists and analysts asked me, why North Korea is not like uh, any other country? And I said, you don't understand. North Korea skipped the two centuries, two, not the two decades, two centuries. Why? At the end of the 19th century, the Japan inching in, Western encroachment, Korea closed the door and then eventually annexed and colonized by Japan. Before the Japanese colony, it was a central kingdom, class system. Did you know that the South Korea has a class system? Kings, nobility, technocrats, common class and the mean class. And then the annexation and one of the most brutal colonial period. And that's the foundation of the division because many went to the Soviet Union and China. The other went to the uh, Western side of it, Japan and United States. And they endowed with a different ideological blessing and understanding. When they returned naturally, there is an ideological division. After that, what happened? Division of Korea, Korean War. And now, under the one of the worst dynastic dictatorial gulag state, it's not even a socialist state. It's not a com communist state at all. Give me a break. If somebody would like to compare Cuba and North Korea, I usually say, there is a simple analogy I can give you. In Cuba, when you are getting up in the morning, your question is, where do I buy the cheapest taco, burrito, and the cheapest Yes. In North Korea, when you get up, where do I find one boiled egg, or one boiled potato? That's the difference. So the basically the it is a traumatized society living in a like a middle kingdom, and there is no way out. But there is a changes. When we wrote the second book, Hidden People of North Korea, I interviewed the hundreds of hundreds of North Korean defectors settled mostly in South Korea, but also some in the Western world, like Canada or Europe. And they all told me, there is a people's economy is beginning. Socialist economy is a controlled economy, but people's economy is beginning because of a 1990s famine that killed between 1 million to 3 million together, they learned they have to teach themselves to survive. So basically this uh, people's economy is changing the North Korean society. It is uh, fascinating. Today, North Koreans have uh, maybe uh, officially considered to be about 5 million cellular phones, but unofficially, unofficially about 7 million phones. In that case, uh, out of uh, 25 million, one out of four have phone. Well, situation is not that clear. It means basically if you are rich, you have about four or five cellular phones. Why? One goes to the bribery to the cadre, one for the hiding for the 
personal dialogue, one for the business, one for the office, something like that. So altogether, 7 million phones. These phones are not roaming service phones at all, but you can call China, you can call sometimes even can reach South Korea. And uh, I had an experience one time, I made a phone call through my mediator in Korea who has a phone to call China, who has a phone to call North Korea. The sound system was not very clear, but I heard the North Korean voice when I asked the one question. It's a fascinating word. Phones, phones are the, uh, like a gold nugget in your hand. North Koreans say, in North Korea, the most important thing is not food anymore. Of course, it's important to survive, but information. Why information is so important? North Korea is not a producing country. It's not a producing the goods and you know, creating capitalistic economy. It's a basically trading economy. Let's say Pyongyang has a beautiful apple. One son has a beautiful potato. You really would like to have some nice potato, fluffy potato, but nothing but apples. So one sister lives in Pyongyang and the other sister lives in Wonsan, basically, hey sis, what's the price of potato there? Oh, they're cheap. What about the apple there? They're cheap. And so in olden days, they put in the sack and they going into the, you know, pay the trucks and the trains. But these days they have cars, they have money. So they move the goods from point A to point B, trading, coming back. One other important thing, currency. Dollar in Pyongyang is the cheapest because they control and nobody wanted to show dollar bills at all, right? If you are caught, you will go to the prison or you will be beaten by the cadre. But they have a lot of dollars, but the value is not very good in the black market. Let's say in Pyongyang, one dollar is about the 2000 North Korean won. God. But if you go to the Shiniju, those border area, uh, I, I'm sorry, I changed the, in Pyongyang is a 6,000, very high. But if you go to Shiniju, it goes down to 2,000. So you, if you put up 10,000 and go to Shiniju and change, you see what kind of profits. So it's a trading places. How do they know? Phones, phones. So North Korean society is changing. Foreign policy of North Korea is heavily, heavily under one uh, huge frame or mantra, means we are threatened by everybody. Why North Korea is occasionally shooting up stupid missiles and testing stuff? Because you need to create the external threat because America is threatening us, South Korea is threatening us. We have to show that we have a military prowess. For that, we have to test it. And it's under constant threat. Regime is using the external threat for the raison d'etat to control society, to control people. In a sense, it's very sad foreign policy. And uh, with the United States, they always ask, we are very much interested in normalizing with you. Well, you know that Currently, South Korean government is talking about peace regime, ending the war. All good. But what North Korea wants is as simple as this. Americans, listen. You have a nukes. We have our nukes. We will not attack you. You will not attack us. This is a self-defense. This is protecting our society from external interference and invasion. So we keep our nukes. So you have a bold switch over policy. Bold switch over policy means basically grant us as we are with the nukes, with the missiles and love us, trust us. And then we sign up normalization. Can you imagine that can happen in, in the US, in the Congress or whatever, even in a divided society like US, regardless of Republicans and Democrats, there is a one voice toward the North Korea, maybe except for Donald Trump, basically saying we cannot deal with these guys as long as they have this nasty policy. So 
North Korea will just uh, parry around the American proposals mm -hmm. as if they are listening and pretending, but they will never respect any deals, any agreement. Agreement basically means the next day you break the agreement. Deals is maybe two days later you break the deal. That's North Korean foreign policy. So if you have later questions about the relationship with China and Japan, I'll be very happy to explain. So the most important current development is North Korean economy. North Korean economy is no longer kind of economy of uh, late 90s that everybody was dying. The people were really dying. The one defector told me when he visited his uncle's house because there was no nothing coming out from his uncle's house. And he knew that his father's beloved younger brother was having some tuberculosis problem. So he packed up some rice and money and bribed the train master and got on the train and visited. The entire family died inside the house. Their body decaying out of starvation. I said, that day he decided, it's not the country that I live my life here. And he told his children, I'll come back to rescue. And he escaped crossing the river. And then his family now all living in South Korea. So he's struggling, but people becoming very smart. That there is a government co-op system and there is a people's lot. People's lot, they grow corn. To eat the corn? No, no, no. They cannot have a corn. They make a corn wine, liquor. Liquor is so important in a devastated society. Do you know why Soviet Union was ruined? Because vodka prices went up 300 times, not because they developed the nukes. Social decay. The people lining up to buy the butilk vodka, a bottle of vodka, and the bread. When they could not have a hands on on their bread and vodka and stuff like that, Soviet Union finally revolted. And so North Korea needed the drug, they needed the wine, but they cannot get it. So these people making the corn wine and selling the market, and then they buy rice. Again, very smart. But is that possible? They beat up by the security guard? Yes, of course. But you know, North Korea's business are not done by men. Have you ever heard of expression, woman in the North, men in the South? Have anyone? That's the typical expression, means woman in the North are smart, hardworking, and also more handsome than men. <laughs> men in the South are the, exactly that case. So I always teasing my husband, since my parents are from North Korea, I am a, I am a woman from the North. <laughs> in any way, women are in the marketplace. Why? You have to report every day about your activities to the, your local unit cadre chief. Husband is a member of the company. If he doesn't appear, Maybe one or two times with a bribery, he can pass. But third time, he'll be beaten and he'll be demoted. He will not get salary. Woman, it's OK. So all the women go to marketplace, while husband pretending to work in the company, of which the salary is about $2 per month, because they pay in North Korean one, which is useless, right? So the women are there. And women are fighters, because they can make life going or bad with their activities. So the security police come, let's say you are the coffee vendor in the hot summer, iced coffee, sir, one iced coffee. And he keep his mouth shut. Okay, you keep up your business. But problem is that next week he, he asks two copies, two cups of coffee. A month later, five cups of coffee. If she sells only 30 cups of coffee already, you know, out, five cups out of 30 cups, she loses business. So they begin to fight. There is a reported demonstration of the marketplaces. Actually, all the women throw the stones and then stand up with the tools and everything and shouting. And then when Kim Jong-un uh, was reported, he said, let them have their own business because he knew that there is a certain ceiling, certain tolerance level. So struggling North Korean economy is continuing, but I would like to emphasize the, with the, on two things. 
why North Korea is still changing, even though on the surface, it looks like a very same society. But you know, in the lake, dog is floating, everything is okay. But if you are a diver underneath the water, if you see the feet is fiercely moving, that that's the North Korean society. Something is fiercely moving and changing every day due to two factors, phones and transportation. Phones and transportation are making North Korea move to do the trading, getting information, making the money. Maybe you've heard of the expression donju, means money owner. It's a North Korea now has a lot of multimillionaire. Some of the Pyongyang people have at least $100,000 in cash in the dead belly of their parents or the kimchi jar or under the toilet, whatever that there is a money flowing. And that is the change in the society. Why? Because they become the employer of the poor people for the slave labor, prostitution, service of massage, house cleaning, and the trickle down economy goes to the common people. And uh, Kim Jong-un is aware of it and he let them enjoy that kind of thing. But on a certain level, when the excessive usage of the rich people's rich money to so spoil the society. Occasionally he pick up scapegoat. North Korean society, highest cadre to the lowest farmer, street cleaner. Nobody lives it with the relaxation. They live with the fear. They don't like, they don't respect the king, but they live with the fear because you don't know when you will be picked up and brutal execution, which we were all known. And then basically giving the message, cadre, everybody behave yourself. Next can be you. That's the social control continuing. Is a social control is a watertight control? No. Bribery is a new tax. With the bribery, you can do anything. One defector told me with the $50,000, a lot of money, even in the US, it's not a small money, but in North Korea, it's like, a, not, unless you are the money owner of the capitalist, you don't have that money. But if you have a 50K, you can rescue somebody who is supposed to be, boom, executed, bribing every cadre because it's all, they all needed the money. So bribery, social decay, information spreading, and the, finally the youth culture. I don't know how, but the, I think the youth these days are the sort of like a genius ninjas with the technologies. Somehow they get the news. They are into the Korean K-pop culture. They are into the Korean fashion. They are into the Korean movie, video, and music and they are not very happy. So Tae Young Ho, who is now in South Korea, elected the congressman, assemblyman, was a second man in the UK, North Korean embassy. Why he defected? His two sons exposed in the life in London saying, dead, over my dead body, we are going back to Pyongyang. So he chose the life for them. And that's the youth culture. And I think all these combined together, North Korea is a bubbly society, it's a fragile society, but on the surface, they have a nukes, they have a king and the uh, flinching and then controlling, continuing and seemingly looks like a, there will never be a light uh, at, the end, uh, at the end of the tunnel. But I must end my presentation to give you a time to raise a lot of questions that no North Korean society is changing and there is a hope. Otherwise, I would not write a book like this to educate the global community. And so with that positive uh, expectation, I will end my presentation and I will open to any questions because I have a reservoir of knowledge and you can attack me. And if you don't raise any interesting or even silly questions, I'll be very disappointed. 
Thank you. <laughs> thank, you thank you very much. That was, that was great. Um, uh, just what's the best way to do this? Wave your hand at me or something and, and uh, I'll call on you. You can use the raise hand function in the, uh, in the Zoom uh, uh, participant box. Uh, where, where can we get the book? Is it available from uh, any local booksellers? Yes, uh, the Kyobo. Kyobo. The Kyobo has them, okay. Yeah, Kyobo has it. And also, the, you know, these days, uh, just Google, you can find everything. Yeah. And if the Kyobo doesn't have it, just uh, shout saying that uh, the author said Kyobo is the dealer. Okay. You know, very uh, unfortunately, books price is not that cheap, but I say mm -hmm. all the proceedings go to my activities to transformation of North Korea. As this is, uh, so I am ruthlessly saying buy the book because of uh, hey, right. <laughs> royalty of uh, royalties, the 8% is basically stupid amount you you get about two dollar fifty cents for each book but uh, oh, i put it this way <laughs> not the money but the idea that somebody bought it means that there are more support for my idea so i am basically if i give a one speech i can make five thousand dollars but i'm promoting my book <laughs> well, we're happy to have you promote the book that's fine yes yes very very much yes. I, i'm always personally on the prowl for new books relevant to Korea and uh, our experiences here. Uh, if nothing else, to get one in our library, which we have a, a continually growing library at our office. And uh, <clears throat> we, uh, we, we try to get anything relevant in that library. So um, it's important for us to have those. Well, the, uh, before you asking questions that a couple of university professors actually asked me that uh, about the book and I asked my publisher send it uh, a complimentary copy and they said perfect book for the textbook, even for the graduate oh. students and PhD candidates because it covers everything. Okay, so let's say what's the what's the North Korean marriage custom. Hmm. In the book. Okay. It's in the book. Okay. It's, so the, it's just like a really, so I told all the stupid congressmen and all these politicians whose <laughs> memory span is about two days, <laughs> spend some money and read the book. Yeah. And then the, I, I am giving a talk to the Hill, to the Congress yeah. uh, in Janu mid January. Basically my message is that I wouldn't say you dumb, but uh, uh, please, yeah. please buy the book and read. <laughs> Yes, indeed. Well, <laughs> those of us who are American citizens and who vote in federal elections, uh, yes, well, we'll move on. <laughs> any, please, your question. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> please, your questions. Um, <laughs> unmute and just jump in. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon or good night from here uh dr all it's really interesting for me when you say uh and talk about the woman's role in north korean economy because mm -hmm. i've been read one of the uh article from andre lankov in 2013 oh, yes. i guess yes uh when they talk about the the changing of the role of women regarding the market in north korea uh could you talk more about it how the patriarchal community could be changed uh, through the market by women's role uh, and how it changed uh, the role of women, I guess, at home and also in the larger part in the society itself. Uh, does women have more roles in the, in the policy making right now? Maybe not that far, but then how, how it hit really changes in, in reality. Thank you very much. Hmm. I actually talked with a real North Korean cadres who were sent to United Nations and Geneva and uh, some of the international conferences. And uh, when they discovered that actually my parents were born in the North, which is the North Korea version of Fairfax County, that Pyongyang County in Pyongyang province, a little bit of a Northeast of the Pyongyang capital city, 
produced 20% of North Korea's top cadres. Mm -hmm. This is the Prime Minister Gang Seokju, who signed the agreed framework with Kaluji. Ge Geung-tae, the godfather of North Korean military buildup, Kim yong soon they were all born in that county. So it's interesting. As soon as they discovered that my parents were born in Pyongyang County and I'm their daughter, they all stood up and took off their Kim Il-sung badge and put on my lapel. Wow. And asking me, can we call you Nunim? Nunim means a dear elder sister, honorific expression. Mm -hmm. I said, I don't know, I have already nice younger brother, but let me think about it. But nonetheless, I accepted all the pins <laughs> and gave to the Americans. <laughs> they treasured them. Yeah. Basically, I, my, I had one question. Now you live in UN, you are working as a ambassador and so and so country. You are privileged to have your family with you. How is your wife's, what is your wife's role? Is she a professional? Oh, no, no, no. She is my masseur, my cook. She makes uh, dinner and she makes me happy. Uh, oh, the woman's role is confined uh, in the basically kitchen bedroom or a marketplace, basically. That's the, their cadres description. I talked with a female cadres, a female defectors who are smart. And they told us that uh, they would be so shocked if Kim Yo-jung, current leader Kim Jong-un's younger sister, a lot of Western press speculated that she may be in the grooming stage in case Kim Jong-un's health suddenly deteriorate or he's incapacitated. She said, oh, the North Korean nasty, the male chauvinism culture in the politics, super politics, will take about 300,000 years to change. So don't expect that. So woman's role is making money. And so through making money, they have a power because they can even employ men. And so through that sense, it's not bad, still some kind of power. And there is a social consciousness about the harassment is now finally penetrating into North Korean society because North Korea harassment in, in the workplace, military, anywhere, either sexually, physically, verbally, intellectually, is an overwhelming reality. And some people got the idea, female leaders. So all good changes, but we need to help them to understand better. Great. <clears throat> Have you been able to visit North Korea? <laughs> oh, you can't say. That's all right. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I had uh, I had uh, one visit, but not to Pyongyang, mm. but to Gumgang Mountain. Oh, okay. So the thing is that, you know, I speak a Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and I understand the Russian. So State Department's joking to me. It the six party talks <laughs> in Katie. <laughs> we don't need about five interpreters, right? Mm. But I'm not a civil servant. I'm not a government member. So if I was invited by, let's say, Chuck Hartman, deputy senior principal, deputy assistant secretary, who is going to Pyongyang, a lot of people will not be very happy because my job will be, uh, that their job will be taken by me. So I could go alone. But I had the highest uh, level of uh, security clearance in uh, when I was working in the government. <laughs> so that makes it <laughs> They say possible. Katie voluntarily came to the bosom of the Our Republic. <laughs> and then the, I am just like a dead, dead person. So I was, mm. but the Gumgang was uh, arranged by Hyundai. Right. And, uh, and also the Korean government. And I made a very bold move. I said, I have one condition to go to Gumgang. I'll bring the three economists with mm -hmm. me. And if you don't accept, I don't go. And they all accepted. 
So we went to North Korea, Pyongyang, and there was a banner waiting, welcome to the US mm. delegation in Pyongyang Hotel, at the Gungang Hotel. Pyongyang Hotel, yeah. Yes, mm. wow. yes, yeah. Uh, Ambassador Kim, you were waving your hand a minute ago. Did you have a question? Well, I was <laughs> greeting, <laughs> but uh, I have a curiosity uh, that, uh, North Korea is changing and uh, it has been changing over a long period of time. And uh, how can we foresee uh, where is the, um, the point that uh, we can expect some uh, real change? Uh, I mean, people's uprising or something critical uh, that uh, needs uh, some intent intervention from south korea Thank that you. is actually the that is actually the question i was waiting for from anybody in the audience i left my institute for defense analysis job in march we don't have any mandatory retirement uh, during the pandemic i thought about what I can do with my knowledge and analytical tools and my network with the defectors and global leaders. And I decided having the top security clearance working inside policy making influential inside the institute or becoming a full free citizen, I weighed on the scale. I discovered that to become free is better because I can freely talk to media if I'm still working at IDA, this uh, presentation should be all processed and uh, pre-scripted, uh, and I can talk to the public. For the last 30 years or so, I've been arguing with the US government, South Korean government, UK, Canada, Australia, you name them, France, Japan, Singapore. North Korea needs some kind of a outside reference, means that their understanding of US and Korea are the worst enemies, try to destroy them. But we have to give them, US is uh, not that kind of country. There are a lot of good people helping other countries. And uh, to do that, we have to systematic delivery of information, expose them to the outside the truth. We need, a, we need some fund. US government never seriously thought of that path. Always asking me, Katie, we have no time. They are making the nukes like a hot muffins from coming out from oven every day. That was the 1990s. I told them they maybe have a barely one bomb. It's time to do it. If they listened that 90s, can you imagine? So basically, the reason that I left the job is that, well, let's not blame the government anymore. As a North Korea specialist, I have a tremendous knowledge reservoir and network, and I can talk to anybody. And maybe starting the small solidarity, uh, consolidated, aggregated efforts to mobilize a similar like-minded defectors and human rights activists and policy makers and analysts to work together toward the goal. And, uh, and uh, I've been doing since March, personally meeting, one-on-one -on -one meeting with a defector, Zoom or at our house. So I've been very busy to cooking food and basically getting their bottom line will you work? And everybody said yes. So I, I, that's the reason why I need to go to overseas to be connected with the so-called my supportive groups in the French government and UK and Canada, as well as the human rights activists and defectors waiting for me. But because of this stupid pandemic, my activities has been limited. South Korea is the most important key country because they have a lot of rich people. So I'm going to Korea. As soon as two weeks rules of a quarantine is gone, I am ruthlessly pursuing public speeches, not just the colleges and think tanks and government offices, but 
in the mega churches. Koreans are rich in mega churches. Basically, I will say you each buy one book, okay? If 5,000 church members buy one book, that's mm. a good deal, right? Yeah. And also, uh, listen to me. You are Christian. We have a moralistic obligation to spend the money for helping North Koreans donate the money. So uh, good news mm. is that this book is being translated into Korean because most senior Koreans, even youngsters who are learning English very hard, English book is tough to read. Mm. So it's now being translated by two professors and will be published next spring, I hope. Great. So did I answer your question? So basically step ahead and let's not blame everybody waiting for the magical revolution happens. Mm. Koreans revolted against government because of US presence, US help, mm. and US needs to do that. And I'm doing the same thing with the US professionals, lawyers, retired military technicians, intelligence officers, government officers, they come again to my home for lunch. I prepare simple ramen <laughs> with a little bit of shrimp and vegetable. And basically our discussion is very sensitive. We don't want to talk loudly in the tea house. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Kim or Ambassador Kim, you should start your own solidarity and buy the book, okay? <laughs> um, hey, Katie, uh, Enoch has a question that he's put in the chat box. He said, can you comment on China's role in the future of North Korea, especially with Mr. Xi in charge for a foreseeable future? <laughs> That's a very good question. <laughs> I, was, I was looking forward to hearing that kind of question. I did not really dwell on the foreign policy chapter, which has a you know, North Korea relationship with every country, major US, China, Russia, Japan, Korea, and EU. But uh, I, I, was th I thought that uh, you, will, you will read the book. So I didn't go into detail. But uh, so uh, before going into the China part directly, the relationship between US and North Korea is a nemesis and enemy, adversary. Relationship between China and the North Korea, everybody says, sealed in blood and uh, you know royalty. They are like uh, lips and teeth and uh, whatever. So it's a great uh, allies, but those days gone. To China, North Korea is a sort of a necessary evil mm. to block the Arctic, uh, the triangle, the inclusion of uh, Japan, Korea, Canada, Australia, and the surrounding Vietnam, Singapore, and uh, like this, you know, Arctic circle. And uh, against that buffering, they need a strategic buffer. And North Korea is a strategic buffer. Yes. So to China, North Korea is a nuisance. Why? Because China wants to be a so-called rising, already risen great power, regardless of a world examination and assessment, <laughs> and they aspire. And these damn younger brothers are behaving very badly and uh, pulling down the China into the dirty swampy water. And it's a nasty younger brother because they never listen to, because mm -hmm. Deng Xiaoping and on, everybody said, do something, reform, free the people. So then those stupid North Koreans do not cross the border and uh, coming to the China. So for them, it's a nuisance. But China is deep pocket. Foreign currency rich deep pocket. They are willing to give uh, occasional help and money mm -hmm. or the, even the airplane for flying Kim Jong-un from Pyongyang to Hanoi, that kind of stuff. But there is no love. And I must add one very important point. I actually spend uh, almost 20 days in the Northern China. I was escorted by Chinese retired Air Force captain, <laughs> American military special force, and then the Fudan University PhD candidate as my interpreter, because I speak beautiful Mandarin, but I don't speak um, EMBN and those of uh, the Northern dialect. 
So three, six feet, between six feet to six feet four tall guys and surrounded the white hair, the small granny, and we spend the time. My job is basically visiting all the North Korean managing restaurants, business bars, trading centers, and also talk with the hidden North Korean defectors in that part and talk with North, uh, Chinese cadres. Believe it or not, I did a survey of a North Korean restaurant uh, clerks. They are all from Pyongyang area, beautiful girls. Why? Because they're not just sell food, they sell beauty, not the sex beauty. Mm -hmm. So the during the daytime, they serve food. During the night, they become a vocal band wearing the uh, uh, glamorous outfit to entice the Chinese to drop the money because the more money that they deliver to the slush fund of a Pyongyang party, that's a good news, right? Mm -hmm. So I went there with the old three guys. And then mm -hmm. I told them, you, you just had a tough time to fly from Beijing. So drink beer and sleep or get some massage in the hotel. I'm going back to the restaurant at three o'clock. Why are you going there alone? We are here to escort you. I said, if I don't return in 90 minutes, come. Right. But I'm going there alone, you live here. So when I went there, all eight female clerks were jumped over me. We were talking about you. And they were speaking in broken Chinese and English. I said, I, 제가 한국 사람입니다. I am Korean. They whole flabbergasted. They thought I was Japanese professor. Oh. Because we use the Japanese, English, Chinese, in the alternate, alternately at the, with those three guys. And so I said, I came here because actually I want to tell you my background. I told that I, my parents' story. And I am a, a real Korean. And they said, uh, what can I do for you? I said, I need a survey. So I said, out of six countries, including your country, which country is the worst country? Which country is the most respectable? Which country is the least respectable? Very simple question. Don't think twice, just say, and they did not hesitate. The first thing was that the worst country that they did not like is China. <laughs> I said, mm -hmm. uh, wow, this was a joint venture, of course. If China doesn't allow the, the territory land and everything, they could not have a restaurant there. Why? You know, there is a Korean expression, the closer to, to somebody, the more you are exposed to the truth. The woman, the about 40 years old the woman was the madame and she was a proprietor controlling all young seven girls. And she took the charge and she said, Yogobayo, all my girls are so pretty, right? Desirable. So all the Chinese men drooling and came for the breakfast, lunch and dinner or whatever, <laughs> even in the evening show, they tried to grab them, their bottom and touch their you know, butt and then try to make them as their mistress. How do you survive that kind of uh, you know, attack every day? Is that we had a code. If uh, like a, the, the, the waiter A is going to the Chinese man B and B likes only A, she doesn't like any other girls. And uh, when they close and he tried to touch her and basically, oh, 잠깐만요, 제가 저기, I have to do something. And she goes into the kitchen and then the, C comes out to serve B. <laughs> <laughs> they had a beautifully coordinated, but the madam said, can you imagine my headache mm. against the scoundrels? Mm. So the 30 people, they said, they said, absolutely. And uh, we have uh, no respect, I said. And then any other disrespectable, hardly any Russians come. One or two come and they are the, heavy drinkers and then because they are so drunken, we don't know whether they are good or bad. That's just right expression, right? And I said the most respectable, you know what? Japanese. Mm. It's a historic site, Dandong, broken bridge and everything. Mm. Japanese historians, anthropologists, the old timers, they come and they are very polite and they come to the North Korean restaurant and they, polite, very behave, and then they give a good tip. 
and they sell the, some North Korean wine and they buy two or three bottles and they behaving very bad, very nicely. Wow. And they are so gentlemanly and ladylike. I said, what about Koreans? Mixed, good ones and bad ones. <laughs> what about the Americans? Since you said you live in America, you are the, maybe the first American came to our restaurant. And the white hair, the American gentleman knew are the, maybe the, for the last three years we saw for the first time. I said, thank you. Uh, what was your impression? He said, seeing you and your, the, whatever the, your gentleman, I say America is not bad. <laughs> <laughs> so I summarized this kind of aggregated data, not only with these girls, but other defectors and delivered to the US government. So China, she in charge of helping North Korea to unify or do anything, give me a break. She actually do not like Kim at all, but he has to swallow, tolerate, remember? Four times North Korea flirted the summit meeting. All done, cut off. Finally, used as a buffer card, invited. So love hate, <clears throat> but close to the hate. Mm. Enoch, I hope that uh, answered your question a little bit. Did I answer correctly? <laughs> Foreseeable future, our the. I don't, I, I hope the C and Kim both disappear. <laughs> so, solidly. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Is this a, maybe going to YouTube and maybe I'll never go to the China, but it's okay. I'm not well, going there. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, if you don't want us to put this on our YouTube channel, let us know. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions? Uh, I don't see anybody. I think Royal Asiatic Society people need a dinner or a drink because they are so silent. Maybe at your time it's seven, already night time. It's, it's getting close to nine o'clock. And, and quite often when we had our in-person lectures, which has been almost yeah. two years ago now, yeah, uh, there was always a group who went out for uh, Chung. And yeah. Mopoli yeah. After the lecture. Sure, sure. That's the that's the right tradition. Yep, yep. So we had that. Okay, uh, David, you've got a question. Go ahead. Yes, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. I'm sorry, I didn't see That's... your hand up. Help, help. Okay, I just came back from exercise, so I'm not wearing a suit. Please forgive me. Um, it's been a long day. Um, good evening, Dr. O. Thank you for uh, your talk. Um, I wrote my PhD on North Korea's diplomatic relations, so I have a little bit of background. <laughs> it's <on> great. It. <laughs> um, Real expert. I would like to give two ideas for you to comment on, if I could, please. Yes. Uh, the first idea would be that North Korea is not a problem for us to solve. That North Korea is not something that we have to address and, and go lobbying to churches. And, and it's, but rather, North Korea is a sovereign nation. We may disagree vehemently with some of its ideas or its uh, political views, but real sovereignty and freedom is to let people do what they want. And so while North Korea is not falling foul of the United Nations 2005 responsibility to protect a mandate, it's not carrying out a genocide, it's not starving its people, that morally it's not our responsibility. I've heard you talk about churches. We could go Matthew 7, 3. You know, we should look at the the stem in our own eye rather than North Korea's fault. So that's the first point that if you would comment on that North Korea shouldn't be a problem for us to solve, but should be respected as a nation in its own right, whether we agree with it or not. Uh, the second point would be that, uh, and I wrote a column about this just as a thought experiment uh, recently, that North Korea might outlast the United States of America <laughs> in its current form. Quite likely. <laughs> Well, and, and again, yeah, I know it, it sounds kind of uh, ridiculous, but we see the troubles in the United States, um, which are which are not insignificant, I don't think. And um, so while this attention seems to be on a different nation, the second thing that I thought it might be interesting for you to comment on that North Korea, rather than being a basket case in desperate trouble, has proven that it can survive. 
might continue to survive and might survive longer than the current form that the United States holds. So there would be my two ideas for you to comment on, please, Dr. Rowe. Thank you very much. All right. It's a very challenging questions, but very good questions because actually make me uh, think and humble. And uh, I do have a definitely different uh, uh, the view than you have. Uh, North Korea and South Korea joined the United Nations in 1991. As, uh, till then, it was a one Korea. The North Korea argue South Korea is us, is part of us. South Korea argue North Korea is part of us. As a matter of fact, my father was a shadow governor of Pyong, Pyongan province in South because it's considered North Korea's part of South. 91, I was working at Rand Corporation and uh, I become a really realist, pragmatic realist, uh, accepting the reality of a policy and politics globally and not the US interfering and changing and shaping them. So I wrote the article for the professional journal, Time for Two Koreas to Join the UN as a member and the formal sovereignty of DPRK and ROK will be established. And that article received the both praise and criticism. But uh, as I wrote very rightly, the two countries joined the United Nations. And I never deny North Korea is a sovereign state. It is a sovereign state. That's the reason why I always implicitly told the US government policymakers you cannot nuke them. You cannot start another war. US is the only country that used the nuke in devastated and uh, inevitable environment. Maybe many people thought that Japan will never surrender. And uh, that's enough. And you cannot even trigger any kind of a conflict to trigger war because proximity of Korea, Japan and everything I don't want any other poor Koreans will be scapegoat of this uh, real politics or superpower politics. So duly respect, North Korea has a constitution, North Korea has a leadership, and North Korea has a 100% absolute supporting rate of the Kim, which is all under the gun, of course. So uh, facade and superstructure and frame, I definitely agree with you. But I have a one very large difference with you. Uh, we teach children, human beings are economic animal, political animal, social animal. And I say human beings different from uh, wild beasts or the bad animals is that we have a moral. We have uh, morality and uh, I think as a human being, not as a South Korean, because I'm no longer South Korean, I am an American. As a human being, I could not tolerate that there is a way to improve the situation that you don't lift the finger and let the 24 million people are the hostages of North Korean system. So today, if I declare there are people to go away, Assad, Putin, C, Kim, I will put in the same level, but Kim maybe as the urgent number one. And uh, we don't do anything interfering North Korean society, either militarily or physically, but I think intellectually, informatively, and ideologically, spiritually, I think we should work together to give them a one day of a freedom. I think that's the whole difference with you. And uh, it's a crisp British accent and the intellectuals always tend to be very fair, but that fairness sometimes comes to, the, to my mind as a non-humanity moral human being. To your second question, you must be right. I'm learning four languages diligently every day online. What are they? I already speak Chinese, Japanese, Korean, read Russian. And I studied Latin and Greek at the Catholic school too. But I'm learning German, Spanish, Italian, and French because I'm planning to immigrate. I 
planned to immigrate during the Trump period. But my husband is a 100% good purebred American, really good hearted man. He said, it's my country, Kaylee. So we survived it. And if this election, if the Biden could not win, I packed up house half to choose one of those countries, but not the major cities, but to the either Corsica or Mallorca or one of those southern parts. US conflict situation today is dire. US is almost look like a lawless society. Do you know the Walnut Creek incident of 50 uh, consolidated gang members drove 25 trucks and, uh, and uh, swiped the goods at the Nordstrom department store before the holiday? This kind of thing never happened. But one thing that Trump administration did was unlabeling the dirtiness of Americans for the first time on the surface globally and very nakedly. And they think they can do anything. And today there is a conflict between stupid Americans and good Americans. There are good Americans and bad Americans. Luckily, good Americans are the 75%, bad Americans are 25%. And we are all working very hard to try to have a unity. America is coming back in a sense when they face the worst crisis. Because when I talked with the Republicans, <clears throat> Six generation Republicans all turned into the Biden voters because saying that I cannot breathe one more single day. Don't underestimate America's strength of the people's power, intellectual freedom, and the freedom of press, elite. We are all working together as a group. And but that uh, stupidity of America was not spending right energy to change North Korea. So that's why I say it's not the time to blame North Korea government. Just like John F. Kennedy says, maybe I will volunteer. So we are creating. And as a matter of fact, I have a lot of supporters of my ideas inside the UK and I need to go there. So that's my answer to you. And you may be challenging me again, but let me tell you that we need a drink nice single malt whiskey when we meet and I will persuade you to join me because your crispiness and your intellectual prowess may help me further to do something good for your very professional target country that you know so much about it but use the positive energy rather than negative analysis. Thank you. Okay, there are two more questions in the chat box. Good. We have a we, we, we but we only <laughs> have a few minutes. So, Katie, I'm going to ask you to respond to them briefly. Briefly, right? Uh, I'm sorry, I was long. No, 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 no. <laughs> the, the, the discussion is good, and we, I, you know, we all benefit from the different viewpoints that we share. Um, uh, Kim has a question: As China influence uh, increases its sphere of influence. Uh, Will it become more challenging for America to maintain its hegemony and support of South Korea's foreign policy? Today, China debate in, North, in the United States, it may be one of the fiercest debates since the Stalin era, let me put it this way. So, but there is a one consensus is that regardless of Republicans, bad Americans, good Americans or Democrats, there is a one consensus is that China is not uh, moving toward the direction that America would like to see. Human rights, domestic control, and uh, all this uh, information control, killing the journalists and all these things, it's pretty much like a criminal state. So America is torn and the debate is going on. And uh, China is a great power. It has a military power. It has, a, it has a money more than anything else but also it used a lot of dirty tricks to trigger the journalists and students to do spy jobs in the United States, which created a problem because there are good students are coming to the US to study. And they are the beautiful students who can contribute. But uh, currently we are in a kind of semi-war. And I don't think China is been a, has, will be a great power player in terms of shaping and changing strategic environment of Northeast Asia. 
there'll be further dampening and creating more problem and creating the South Korea to be trapped between the rocks and hard wall. But South Korea has to be crystal clear. You have to be a squeaking power. When somebody squeaks on you, steps on you, you squeak. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you will be neglected by US, you will be despised by Japan, you will be treated badly by North Korea, you will be downgraded and then condescended by China. That's the South Korea's future strategic option. I've been writing a paper on how South Korea to behave and choose right path. Okay, the, the, the last question, I'm afraid it'll have to be the last question. Um, uh, do you envision Japan playing a bigger economic, diplomatic, and perhaps military role in Asia as a counterweight to China? There are signs of a potential revival in a different form, of course, of the East Asia co-prosperity sphere. And what impact would this have on North Korea? Uh, Japan revised the U.S.-Japan defense guide, cooperation defense guidelines three times. It was made in the 70s uh, to against the Soviet Union. And then when the North Korea becoming a WMD state developing nukes, uh, they did a second revision. And third revision is rising of China and then global changes of uh, marketplaces and the counterterrorism and the regional conflict. And the third task, I was a task leader for the US government and Japan government for the 35 each country representative from the <clears throat> White House to the prime minister's office and everything. Basically, uh, I kept this as a top secret and no Koreans ever heard of it because they will say you are making Japan as a military power. The revision was done because Japan wants to be a normal power. They would like to have a right system of defense right system of information sharing and technology with the US. And they would like to be uh, strong enough to buffer against any encroach encroachment and uh, bad behavior of China. Sorties of Chinese uh, airplanes over the so-called uh, disputed islands was recorded more than 500 times. You get the nerve breaking down. So based on all this, Japan is working very hard to normalize their defense system and they are lining up uh, their support with Australia, Andrews, and the US package. And they are also dealing with the EU, EU with the respect and they are supporting the NATO. So Japan is much more global player in a sense. And then the, to do circumventing Chinese very militant and belligerent positioning as a new power. So there is a certainly some kind of, a, not the cold war, but some kind of fuzzy warm, wavy war is going on. And I think Japan is an important country. And that's the reason why South Korea, Japan should reconcile rather than becoming an enemy because it's a value sharing democracies. Did I answer okay? Very good, thank you. Um, <clears throat> we really appreciate uh, all of you for joining our lecture tonight. Um, our next lecture <clears throat> will be on December 14th, 7.30 PM, Korean Standard Time, we'll be joined by Rob York, who is the Director for Regional Affairs oh, at the Pacific Forum in Honolulu. Uh, he's formerly Chief Editor of NK News and formerly a Production Editor at the South China Morning Post. His writings have appeared in North Korea News, the SCMP, Reason, the National Interest, War on the Rocks, and Asia Times. He's a PhD candidate in Korean history at the University of Hawaii. He's going to talk about <clears throat> the change in US relations with both Koreas uh, during the presidency of Donald Trump. Uh, after decades of status quo, Donald Trump tried to rock the playing field quite a bit. And uh, so he's gonna share his thoughts about that um, the legacy of Donald Trump's Korea policy is ultimately to, pr to prove that the status quo, unsatisfactory as it is, exists for a reason. It would be very interesting to hear what Rob has to say about that. Um, please check our website and our YouTube channel where you can find recordings of past lectures and other helpful content. 
We look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you all very much and good night to most of you. Good morning to Katie. And if you have any more questions, you can just Google me and then you can find the email and website and then I'll be very happy to share my views because oh, I need all of you to work together. <laughs> oh, thank you for that generous offer. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Good night all. Bye.